welcome everyone to, to our Latin American History Seminar. A special welcome to our friends and colleagues across the Atlantic and in Europe uh, and outside Oxford. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, uh, to welcome you all to, to our weekly seminar. And it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, our speakers uh, today. Uh, we uh, will be discussing uh, Jesus San, San Jurgo's uh, recent book, The Blood of Our Brothers, published by University of Alabama Press uh, late last year. And it's a great pleasure to, to welcome Jesus back uh, uh, here. He is a lecturer in Hispanic and Latin American Studies at Cardiff University, uh, and the author of the book we are going to discuss. Uh, soon he will be joining the University of Cambridge as an early career fellow at the Libre Hume and Isaac Newton Trusts. And his new research project is entitled Black Soldiers of the Caribbean, Race, Slavery, and Radical Politics. He has studied history at an undergraduate level at the University of Oviedo and then obtained he, an MA in Race and Resistance and a PhD in Spanish and Atlantic History at the University of Leeds under the supervision of Manuel Barcia and Gregorio Alonso. And actually it was there at Leeds where I first met him when he was a very active student organizing a conference of, of the graduate students on Latin American studies uh, in, in, in the UK. So welcome, Jesus, it's a great pleasure to see you back. And joining us to discuss his books is Professor Randy Sparks from the University of Tulane, the University, sorry, for, at Tulane University in New Orleans. He's the author of five books and many articles and book chapters focused on the history of the US South and Atlantic world. His publications include Africans in the Old South, mapping exceptional lives across the Atlantic world, but the Negros are masters, an African port in the era of the slave trade, and the two princesses of Calabar, an 18th century Atlantic Odyssey. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to welcome you all, uh, and a great pleasure to welcome in particular uh, Jesus Sanjurjo and Randy Sparks. So the floor is yours. You are muted, Randy. <laughs> Okay, this is better. I hope you can hear me now. Um, thanks, Eduardo, for that introduction. And, and I'm very excited to be here uh, to talk about um, Jesus's uh, new book. Um, and I'm just going to start with a very broad question, Jesus, just to ask you to tell us how you came to this topic and what you set out to accomplish and how well you think you achieved those goals in the end. Well, th thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eduardo, for, for the invitation. Uh, to participate in this event today. Uh, I think that uh, everybody in this call would say the same, but I wish we could be in Oxford today, but it's it's brilliant anyway, being able to see so many familiar names and familiar faces. And, and thank you as well, Randy, for, for accepting the invitation. It's, it's, it's a great honor to, to discuss my book with you today. Um, so in, in the blood of our brothers, is the natural continuation of the of the work that I started uh, as a PhD student working with Manuel Barcia and Gregorio Alonso and at the University of Leeds. In my PhD, uh, in my PhD dissertation, what I tried to do was essentially to rethink the history of the anti-slavery movement during the 19th century uh, in Spain, using the Spanish sources and adding the history of Spain to uh, build a much more um, comprehensive theory of how anti-slavery ideas circulated in relation to the British anti-slavery movement, the British campaigns uh, across the Atlantic world to put an end to the slave trade. Um, and from that work that I did as a, as a PhD student, what, I, what I've tried to do in, in this book is to essentially address um, one single question or one main question um, that I think that a lot of historians have struggled to understand both in Spain and, and outside of, of, of Spanish imperial history, which is why in a country with liberal institutions from the 1830s, the anti-slavery uh, movement in Spain failed to uh, become anything similar to the anti-slavery movement in Britain, in France, or in the United States. And linked to this question, why therefore the slave trade continue operating in its most important colony at the time, um, the island of Cuba. So to, un to understand that question, I, I, I kind of like adopted two uh, approaches or two lenses. 
to look into this. The first one had, has to do with something that is not unique to the history of the anti-slavery movement. It is perhaps something that has been detected um, by Spanish historians when rethinking Spanish <clears throat> history that has been done from abroad, has been done by the British Academia, or the American Academia, or the uh, Francophone Academia. Uh, and that is this idea of looking at Spain in terms of failures or distortions or things that don't belong to the canon. And, and, and that usually refers to the idea that the canon is fixated or is established by looking at non-Spanish cases or by putting or looking at Anglo cases in, 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 in most narratives. So I, I think that it was important for me in the book to establish that the way in which history happened in Spain is not uh, a distortion, it's not a failure, it's simply how things happened. And, and that we need to start, you know, to overcome a historical narratives that try to establish that the only way in which the end of the slave trade should have happened is in the way of the British, the French, or the American anti-slavery movement. That was not the only option available. And, and I think that thinking it in terms of failure or distortion, it, it's a problem. And, and then the second, the second idea was this, this supposed contradiction, at least for some uh, um, Spanish historians, between the idea of having a liberal state with its liberal institutions and its liberal political relations with the persistence of slavery and the persistence of the slave trade. And I, I try to challenge that by saying two things. On the one hand, liberalism was perfectly compatible with the slave trade and slavery. There is no essential contradiction between the two. And we can have, and we can even argue that the uh, uh, planters, the slave traders, the people who were backing and promoting the slave trade and the slavery in Cuba and in the Spanish empire, across the Spanish empire, were among the most liberal politicians and the more the, the, among the most liberal people in the empire, because they are thinking of liberalism as economic transformation, as political representation for them, of course, but they are not necessarily thinking as a, a battle, an essentialist battle between the free and the unfree, at least not in those terms. And the racial element is, is crucial. And the second aspect to answer that question, to tackle that question, um, is the idea that um, anti-slavery ideas and anti-slave trade ideas were not advanced exclusively by so-called liberal, progressive, egalitarian, anti-racist activists. Uh, at all. What we see in the history of the Spanish empire during the 19th century is that uh, traditional absolutist uh, institutions, uh, conservative politicians, racist politicians are going to be at the forefront of advocating for the need to end the slave trade for multiple reasons. Some of them very far away from the reasons that William Wilberforce or Thomas Clarkson um, or Lincoln later on are going to explain why we need to do that. For example, just to give you a, a little insight into this, which tends to be a little bit surprising for those of, of, of for, for colleagues who are not uh, familiar with the history of the anti-slavery movement in Spain. I argue in the book, one of, one of the most prominent anti-slave trade voices, one of the most prominent anti-slave trade messages um, is the one of Jose Antonio Saco. This is a, um, what, what we can clearly establish as a, as a liberal thinker, uh, trained as a lawyer, he's living in exile in Paris, he's representing the planters in many ways, but not in the, in the issue or in the matter of the slave trade, because he wants to stop, and I quote, the Africanization of the island of Cuba. He wants to whiten in the island of Cuba. So his abolitionism comes from a profoundly white supremacist, we will call it today, racist ideology. Um, so it's important to take those elements into consideration because otherwise we're just simply looking for a, a Wilberforce 2.0 or a well, Thomas Clarkson 2.0. And, and that was never going to be the case. The idea of forcing the, uh, the British canon into Spanish politics simply doesn't work. Thanks for laying out some of those 
big, <clears throat> big themes, and I want to come back to them in a second. But I also wanted to ask, given Spain's very long history with enslavement, why do you think the study of this topic has perhaps lagged behind in Spain? Oh, that's a very, that's an excellent question, but a very difficult one. Um, I think that, and, and, and it's, it's almost like a, 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 a refuge for, for any historian who, 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 who <clears throat> was trained in history in Spain. I, as Eduardo was mentioning before, I, I, I did my, 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 my undergraduate studies at the University of Oviedo, and I always, I kind of like tell this as an anecdote, but, but I think it illustrates very well um, where we are in terms of the history of the slave trade and history of slavery in Spain. When I decided that I wanted to write my uh, undergraduate dissertation on the history of abolitionism, because I was I started to work with uh, a lecturer, uh, Dr. Ismael Sarmiento, who had just arrived from the University of, of Paris um, to Oviedo. And I said to him, like, I really want to work on these issues that you work on. Um, he said, like, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's brilliant. But you will find a problem is that there are no books about this in the university library. And that was true. Like even the, the Spanish historiography on the field, uh, you know, the colleagues from the University of Barcelona, the Pompeu Fabra, the uh, University of Complutense in Madrid, who were publishing about this, the university was not even interested in, in acquiring those books. So, and, and that's kind of like how I started collaborating with, with Professor Manuel Barcia was because I wanted to read the people who were writing about this history and there wasn't that much stuff available at my university. And I think that is quite telling of the, of the reality of, you know, how much historians have to, in Spain have traditionally uh, thought of the importance of the slave trade and slavery. There is a combination of factors probably to, to explain that. On the one hand, you have the idea that the 19th century, 19th century history, generally speaking, not just imperial history, but particularly 19th century studies in Spain have traditionally been uh, disregarded as not very relevant, not very important, not very significant. Uh, the, the Spanish dictatorship of, of uh, General Francisco Franco uh, dislike the 19th century, um, 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 like like a, a time that of of chaos and revolution and and uh, uprisings and so on. So he he made it very clear that the 19th century should not be the center of attention. So um, a lot of the traditional historiography in Spain focuses on the imperial history of the early years of the empire, the conquest and colonization, but not so much on the end of the of the empire. So that would be one thing. But then in some universities like mine that kind of like have a very progressive history department and um, you know some of the most interesting histories that have been written about the history of the labor movement, the history of the second republic and the dictatorship come from the University of Fibiedo, the 19th century has always been perceived as not as exciting or not as relevant. Um, and within that bigger problem, I think that the history of slavery and the slave trade has also been thought as something that didn't really affect Spain that much because he, he, he creates this division, which is of course a, a, an artificial one between um, the studies that affect black people and indigenous people in the Americas and the real history of Spain, which is the, of course the white history of, of the peninsula. So I think those two factors create kind of like the perfect storm to make it very difficult for a, a 20 year old student at the University of Oviedo to, to write about the history of the slave trade. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, going back to one of your themes, you know, which is how the path to abolition in Spain differed from the, from the British model. Um, I wonder if we, you know, the more, the, the more we widen this lens uh, uh, about the history of abolition beyond the British model, um, do you think that Britain begins to look more like an outlier than, than a model? Um, I think that for some people, uh, for some uh, activists in the 19th century, Britain was a model in many ways. And, and I think that, you know, we should not 
underestimate how powerful in ideological terms not you know and we will we will discuss later on you know when 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 we stop talking about ideological influence and we move into military influence and 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 the and the the, the gun the gunpowder re, re, diplomacy um gunboat diplomacy um but um i think that you know and and i started the book with with this kind of like image with this um uh, idea of a young Agustin de Arguelles, who is kind of like the, the main character of the of chapter one in the book, uh, who is working as a spy uh, in London for, for the Spanish government at the time, and who decides to go to the House of Lords to, to listen to the discussions on the abolition of the slave trade. That's the day in which the law for the abolition of the slave trade finally passes so he gets through the house of Lords as the final process before ratification by the monarch uh, so so i think that the, the first question that we need to to engage with is why would a spanish politician even care why, why why did he think that that was an important session to attend and the reason is because you know augustin der way is profoundly admire the british political system and profoundly admire british politics uh, so even though he was a spy, he was very much being um, infected with, with Britishness, if you want. And, and he's going to reflect on that when he goes back into exile and, and you know, in discussions with other uh, important politicians in London, he admires profoundly the British way of organizing its public life. So I have no doubt that, that when a few years later he gets the chance of collaborating with the British diplomatic mission in, in Cadiz, um, he wants to be the William Wilberforce of Spain. And he wants to represent that achievement for you know, humanity and philosophy and the lights and, and, all, and all this um, kind of like background to it. Um, but of course, we need to reconsider how much of that is how they wanted to think of themselves and of themselves and how much they wanted to represent that uh, and to the and, and to compare that with the reality of Spanish politics, the day to day uh, parliamentarian reality, the day to day decisions that were being made by politicians in Madrid and in all the parts of Spain. So, yes, the, the idea of what the British are doing and how they British did the abolition of the slave trade and the slavery, it's very important and should not, should not be disregarded. But also we need to consider how, how, did, how, how was that going to happen in practical terms in Spain? And I think that one of the mm, kind of like the things that become very, very clear right from the beginning of the 19th century for people like Arroyes is that the way in which it happened in London, in, in Westminster, it was not going to be the way that it was going to happen first in Cadiz and later on in Madrid, simply because the material conditions were completely different. The uh, ideological background of the people who were uh, representing in Cadiz or leading the country was completely different. So, you know, all, all, some elements that are crucial to understand the anti-slavery movement in Britain, like, you know, the, the history of, of Quakers, the non-conformists, all those things don't really, exist in Spain. What you have, for example, is a very powerful and important Catholic church that is going not to have a very official or institutional position until very, very later on in the process. So conditions are different. The people are different. So why, as historians, should we expect the same result, right? I think, I think that's, that's what, 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 what is very obvious when you, when you put it in those terms. But even for the British, it doesn't make sense during the 19th century when they say like why why do they why why they don't try to do it the way we did it right and and the first one to tell them no it cannot be done like this is Agustin der Weyes in Cadiz he says like no let me lead this let me uh, create a, a a discourse a message that you know resonates in 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 the in the in the hearts of the of of the of the members of parliament because if if you just present it as a as a British imposition they're going to say no, um, because, you know, the, the, the history of this of the Spaniards and British is not an easy wonder in the 18th century. So it, it wasn't that many people in Cadiz that admired Britishness and British politics as much as Arguelles. Um, 
the, the, the sort of diplomatic dance between Britain and Spain um, that's, that's going on during this entire uh, period is one of the main themes of your book. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, that, that kind of pressure that, that the British try to bring to bear on Spain. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I like the idea of thinking it in terms of a dance. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how much I'll be able to push the, the metaphor, but uh, 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 here we go. Um, <laughs> I would say it starts as, um, as, a, as a tango, and they are very, very, very well coordinated. Like if, if you think of the first moment in which the British are trying to truly collaborate, and I think it's important to stress that, you know, in the context of the French invasion of the Spanish, of the Iberian Peninsula, this group of liberal politicians gather in Cadiz to draft what it will become the most progressive constitution, um, well, the first constitution of, this, of, of the history of Spain, but one of the most progressive constitution in its um, cultural context, the constitution of 1812. And in that political context, the British contact Agustin de Arguelles, who, as I said, had, you know, he, he they know him because he had been living in London and he had had some contacts and conversations with, with some important people in London. And they contact him to tell him, we're going to propose to your government the abolition of the slave trade. What do you think? And he says, like, wait a minute, let me read about this. Give me information. Give me uh, abolitionist propaganda. Give me the material to work with and let me build our own anti-slavery ideas. Let me build our own abolitionist um, uh, discourse. And they say yes, and they wait, which is you know, remarkable when you look at the, the general context of you know, the British are basically stationed in the Navy in the port of Cadiz because they are being invaded by the French and they decide to wait. They, they, they don't put too much pressure on Arruelles and, and other politicians during this specific uh, episode. To, to rush the legislation through. And Arguelles decides to do something that is at the time thought to be very clever by him and, and the people working with him, which is to link the abolition of the slave trade with the abolition of torture. So he brings both things together to the parliamentary debate in Cadiz, and he thinks that he has the numbers and he thinks that, you know, that these ideas of enlightenment and the triumph of philosophy that are so important in the narrative of Cadiz that are going to allow him to get that legislation through and to incorporate that to the constitutional text, which would have, it would have been remarkable if the abolition of the slave trade becomes part, had become part of the, of the constitutional text. The reaction is uh, brutal from, from, the, from the Cuban sectors or the, 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 those represented the Cuban planters and Cuban aristocracy in, in parliament and the, the legislation never went through. But the reaction of the British government is not against their ways and they are going to keep saying this in private correspondence between Madrid and the foreign office for many, many years that Arguelles tried, tried his best and they recognized that and they recognized the, his role in trying to spark that conversation very, very early on in a very, difficult political context. Um, so we have the tango. Uh, then things get a little bit less uh, friendly. Uh, when Ferdinand VII returns to Spain uh, uh, in, at the, after the collapse of the, of the Cortes of Cadiz in, 18, in 1814, the British kind of like tolerate the idea of Ferdinand VII returning. There is no appetite in London to do anything else about that. Uh, and Ferdinand VII creates uh, a few years of absolute fear against uh, liberal ideas and, and those who had been advocating for those ideas in Cadiz. Uh, Agustin de Arroyas himself is first in prison in the north of Africa and later on in Mallorca. So it's gonna be a really, you know, very tough uh, decade for uh, a few years for, for, for liberal politicians in, in Spain. And during those years, the negotiation changes dramatically. The British are trying to negotiate with Fernando VII first, what they call an official statement or a formal declaration by the Spanish king as part of the new 
agreement of friendship or the reestablishment of diplomatic relations between Spain and um, and Britain, which will become what, what we now call as the Treaty of Madrid. Um, and in that declaration, Ferdinand VII says something incredibly vague, but nevertheless important. It says something like, you know, um, I agree with the sentiments of, of, of His Britannic Majesty, and I will find a way somehow one day to put an end to the slave trade. So basically nothing, but enough for the British government to, you know, attach to that and keep bringing that declaration time and time again. And as part of that pressure that the British put, the, the Spanish, uh, Ferdinand VII, the Spanish king says like, all right, all right, um, I'll just consult with the, um, with, with, the, with the two most important advisory councils in the kingdom, the, the, the Council of State and, and the Council of the Indies. And what is remarkable, and that is kind of like the, something very relevant in chapter two of the book, is that you know, the, the Council of State follows the script and says like, nah, this, the abolition of the slave trade doesn't make any sense. And also let's not forget, we're not um, horrible Protestants, we're not Anglicans. The slave, slavery and the slave trade, it is a bliss in the Spanish empire. So if something we are, Sell, saving those poor souls from, from uh, a barbaric life by bringing them into the, the Catholic church and so on. So nothing to worry about. But the Council, of, the Council of the Indies remarkably is going to say, yes, we have to abolish the slave trade and we have to do it now. And in the language that they use in their report, they, they talk about um, you know, that this, 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 this enslavement of our fellow creatures. Uh, which is very similar. It resonates with the language that Agustin de Arguelles had used in Cadiz only a few years before. So things get complicated for, for Ferdinand VII. He's going to dismiss uh, that agreement, but eventually he will have to agree to a treaty with the British that will become the Treaty of 1817, in, by which they accept that the slave trade will eventually end in 1820. Uh, and the British think, okay, that's that's it. We've done it. We've 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 convinced the the Spanish monarch, and this will be the end of the slavery, and this the end of the slave trade. Sorry, um, and of course not. Uh, a lot of things happen between eighteen seventeen and eighteen twenty, including uh, three years of of a liberal regime uh, preceded by a military uprising that really reshapes politics in Spain forever. But what matters for our conversation here is that in 1820, the slave trade doesn't end. It becomes illegal, but it doesn't end. And every single Spanish government after that, pretty much until the 1860s, is going to do everything they can to protect it and promote it. And that's when we actually see the biggest numbers in the history of the slave trade to Cuba. They happen during the illegal period. So, Yes, it becomes illegal, but it doesn't stop at all. So the British, you know, cannot believe what's going on because they thought we had an agreement. You know, this we pay you a massive compensation for this that you used to buy warships from Russia to try to reconquer Mexico. That's that's the, the overall picture. <clears throat> um, and you told us that you we were going to stop the trade, and this is not happening. So the 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 dance turns rather violent from from there on i don't know some kind of like hip hop dance very very street like aggressive type of dance uh and things gradually escalate uh towards you know the episode of the uh, hms robney that you have studied and you know very very well um the uh decision of the british government very much in collaboration with the anti slavery movement in britain to create the figure of a superintendent that represents the interest of the liberated Africans. So those enslaved Africans that had been liberated by the, mainly by the British, let's be honest, is supposed to be by a mixed commission court, but without the pressure of the British, that would have never happened. So those who have been liberated by the British, so those uh, enslaved Africans who are in the middle passage, but are intercepted and, and, and liberated by the British, 
they are going to have a voice to represent them and they choose a very, very radical uh, uh, British activist to, to do that. And so things start to become a lot more tense, a lot more complicated, that relationship gradually deteriorates. And that's what I define in the book, or right? I kind of like found this term to, to talk about these long years uh, as the, uh, the balancing act strategy on the Spanish side. So this idea that the, the Spanish are going to say, mm, yes, the slave trade is illegal, but we can't do anything about it. If we try to stop it by force, uh, we will have to, you know, to massacre half of the white population in Cuba. We're not going to do that. It's not in our interest. And also, and this is what they are going to use constantly in their negotiation with Britain. If you push us too much, if you force us to stop the slave trade against our will and against the will of the white population of Cuba, there is a real risk of A, an American invasion of the island, supported by the southern states to create Cuba, to include Cuba as part of the, of the American Republic, or two, an independent Cuba. And that was a very real threat because, you know, by, by the, the late 30s and 40s, most of the Latin American, the, the former Spanish colonies in, in, in mainland America have now become independent republics. So, so the idea of, a, of Cuba joining those uh, revolutionary uh, movement, that revolutionary movement was pretty reasonable, pretty, uh, it was not unthinkable in any way. So that's really going to stop the British from adopting anything similar to what they are actually doing against Brazil, which is kind of like part of that same conversation in terms of what the British are trying. Um, because in 1845, what the British do is that they basically start assaulting, sending military uh, sending troops, sending the military, the Navy, to attack those ports in Brazil where enslaved people are being, are being introduced, are being uh, smuggled in. Uh, they are not going to do that with the British. And, and the reason for that, or the reason that I argue in the book is, is, is two things. On the one side, the risk of Cuba becoming either an independent nation, which the British don't like the idea of that, or becoming American, which they even dislike more. Um, and also something that it was difficult to measure, but I think it's very important, which is this idea that for the foreign office, Spain is still represents an imperial power and some an institution that should be treated with respect, uh, something that they don't have for Brazil at all. And I think that there is some correspondence in the book that really illustrates this very well, the idea that, you know, these new Latin American republics, uh, they need to feel, I think that the quote is, they need to feel the power of the stick in their backs from time to time to understand, you know, who's, who's, in, who's in control, who's in power. With the Spanish government is different. They are going to have very, very tense negotiations, but it's never, the possibility of a military invasion of Cuba was never on the table. Uh, so, and then the final epilogue is perhaps when Britain decides to stop dancing <laughs> and they say like, you know what, if, if the, you're not going to dance, uh, you're not going to follow my lead, I'm not going to dance with you. And first, they stop diplomatic relations with Spain very briefly for two years. And th uh, there is other things that are happening in Spain that, you know, are part of that decision mainly the accusation of uh, the Spanish government that Britain was um, you know, planning uh, a military coup in Spain um, to kind of like put a, a more liberal uh, general in power. Uh, but also the idea that uh, the British are putting too much pressure on, on the Spanish government to abolish the slave trade. So diplomatic relationships stop for two years. And then the, the final, the epilogue of, of all this is when the British said, decided that there is nothing to negotiate with, with Spain anymore. There, there is no point in negotiating with them. And they go and negotiate with uh, the victorious Abraham Lincoln in the aftermath of the, of the Civil War. And they agree that they are going to stop the slave trade into Cuba. And what is left for Spanish politicians is to try 
in a very desperate move to claim some agency over the process. And they say like, look, this has been decided. We don't have uh, the capacity to argue against it or to protect the slave trade anymore or to try anything. Let's just stop the slave trade as the best way to protect slavery for as long as we can. And that's the final process. And at that point, it's very interesting because that's really a very clear example in which the anti-slavery movement, it's very much you know, of the opinion that we need, to stop, we need to keep fighting for the end of slavery, the abolition of the slave trade in the, 18, in the late 1860s is not a great success. We need to keep fighting for the end of slavery as an institution. Uh, but the British government says like, no, nah, there is no uh, public appetite for more anti-slavery campaigns in Britain. There is um, a, a, a real desire of the British government to collaborate more closely with Spain in an increasingly very complex Atlantic world. Uh, and the Spanish and the British government decides that they are going to drop the, the demands for the end of slavery as an institution, at least for some time. Uh, and of course, that coincides or that, that happens at the same time of the eruption of the various uh, wars for independence in Cuba. So, um, you know, that is really going to create other concerns for the British government that have to do with who is going to control Cuba. And the threat, according to the British, or the, 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 the idea that they, they perceive as a, as a real threat, the possibility of an, of an American invasion uh, of the island. Uh, some historians have, have looked at, at Britain's efforts to sort of strong arm Spain in this regard as, as maybe setting back the cause of abolition. Would you say on balance that, how would you come down on that argument? So, so, so can you repeat the question, sorry? Some scholars have suggested that Britain's effort to, to strong arm the Spanish, oh, yeah. uh, you know, may have actually set back the cause, not promoted it in Spain. I'm wondering, you know, on balance, how would you come down on that argument? It's very interesting. I, I, I find it, um, I, I think I, I would answer this in, in differentiating two very important aspects. On the one hand, you have the anti-slavery movement and the anti-slavery movement, no doubt, advanced the cause for abolitionism across Atlantic world. I think that without the commitment, the passion, the, 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 the the capacity to transform the way in which in, in, in a whole country thought of the slave, of thought, of, thought of a slave trade and slavery in Britain. You know, I'm thinking, of course, William Wilberforce, Thomas Clarkson, and Aquiano. Without their campaigning, um, uh, there is no reason to think as historians that the slave trade or the slavery will, you know, kind of like naturally disappear or dissolve. There is no, no, none of that. None, the idea of the econocide, I think, is very, very present in this idea that this didn't make economic sense for Britain at the time. It was, it was really our, uh, the, the passion and the, 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 the humanity of, of, of this activism that convinced the, the wider <clears throat> sectors of, of the British population to do it. And they tried to do the same thing with Spain. I think that uh, we need to acknowledge that the anti-slavery movement you know, when you read the letters of William Wilberforce in the in the tens, in the in the in the 1810s, he's very much like, oh, let's let's provide these Spanish politicians with the ammunition that they need, with the pamphlets, the the the, the books, the propaganda, the um, you know, the merchandise, so the, the little uh, things for them to so because they want them to do the same that they have done. Obviously, they didn't really understand Spain. Uh, as well as they they, 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 they they wish they had, because that way of campaigning was impossible in a country with no democratic tradition, or if you don't want to use the word democratic, with no, um, the way in which politics was very, very different to the way politics work in Britain. And for example, the possibility of people to gather in their, in their towns and cities to discuss politics publicly, it was very, very restricted to uh, very, very small groups. Um, so I think that 
it's undeniable that the British anti-slavery movement did uh, contribute enormously to progressing, advancing anti-slavery ideas, abolitionist ideas in Spain at the beginning, no doubt about that. However, there is an element that we need to consider when looking at that period in which things start to get really nasty between Spain and Britain, in which the, the relationship between both of them starts to become uh, very untenable because the reaction from wider sectors of the Spanish population and the Cuban population to what they perceived as an imposition from uh, a rival empire is to explain that what is happening is um, simply uh, the aggression of the British against the interest of Spain. Um, let me just turn off someone. Someone turn off his mic, and, and I can hear it very loud in my. Oh, there you go. Oh, there, thank you, thank you for that. Um, so so yeah, a, a lot of 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 people in Cuba and Spain are going to think of this whole abolitionist campaigns as a way of ruining Cuba's economy, of competing with with Spain. Uh, in terms of its control of the Atlantic world and so on. Um, I think that when the British decide to stop convincing the Spanish public and they try to uh, force the Spanish government, so they, they, they change the focus from trying to create uh, uh, an anti-slavery movement from within Spain and they just simply use diplomatic channels I think that that's when they when they failed, because I think that there is a very interesting example in, in 1840 when they are organizing an international conference in London and they send a few delegates to, to Spain to try to find some allies and identify some people and they and they find them. They found people in Barcelona, they found people in Zaragoza, they found people in Madrid. These are liberal politicians who are very receptive to all these ideas. But that required time and money and resources that for the foreign office was not the most interesting way of achieving this. They feel that politics have been so erratic and complicated in Spain that it was, it was easier to use uh, you know, a, a much more straightforward negotiation with the, with the Spanish government to force them to change. And, and, that, and the possibility for this uh, activists who are sympathizing with the abolitionist cause really becomes very difficult because the argument of or the anti-British sentiment of the wider population both in Spain and Cuba makes it very very difficult. I'll give you an example that uh, I know that you've, you've studied as well um, which I think really illustrates this very well. Something that for the British represents how uh, how to adopt a much more aggressive position on a debate, but, but on the Spanish case is simply seen as a provocation. When they send this, uh, this vessel, the, the HMS Romney, to the port of Havana to, uh, as to, to basically operate as, a, as accommodation. We, you are frozen. This is... Is that the case, Randy, for you too? No, I, I, oh, you're back. Sorry, you're back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you oh. were frozen. What was I? Frozen yeah, for two, for two, for the last minute. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so I was saying that I'll give you an example about about how this this work in practice. Something that for. Again. That happening to you, Randy, as well. No, it's, uh, on my end, he's frozen, yes, but... Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, so he probably has to sort of get out and come back again. Oh, that seems to be what he's doing, maybe. Perhaps the Foreign Office is intervening at this point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's going very well. I mean... Uh, 
if he comes back, you probably may want to wrap up in the last in the next ten minutes. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Hope he comes back. Finish the conversation. Let me send him an email. Okay. Here he is. Okay, good. Hello. Welcome back, hey. Jesus. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So no, you're, you're on my phone. You're on my phone because um, my Wi-Fi just decided to stop working. So <laughs> let let's see if that. Uh, hopefully we'll come back, but as long Is as right? can... well, yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> so I was saying that I'll I'll use an example of of something that the British uh, thought as as a you know politics in action, something that will really awaken the minds of of people in Cuba, uh, and that the Spanish and the Cubans thought it was just a provocation when they stationed the HMS Robney, this this vessel from the from the Royal Navy. In Havana to to serve as accommodation for the recently liberated Africans by the mixed commission court of Havana, they decide that some of the soldiers, and that was no accident, some of the soldiers on board of that of that vessel were going to be black soldiers. Uh, for the Spanish authorities and the Cuban authorities, that is an obvious provocation, something completely unnecessary. But for the uh, uh, British, that is going to demonstrate for you know the 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 the, the black pe the black people working in Havana Sport that there was an alternative. There was a universe outside of a slavery, outside of the oppressive Cuban conditions, um, to the point that you could become uh, a soldier in the Royal Navy. Right? For the Spanish, that it's seen as as an obvious provocation, something that has no reason for the British to do apart from the will to excite a a, a revolt or for for creating problems and troubles in, in the island. So that is going to spark a very strong sentiment of anti-Britishness in, in Cuba and in Spain. And that's going to, to make things tough for those who, from those kind of like progressive angles are going to try to advocate for the need to one, abolish the slave trade, but also to collaborate with the British to do so. Um, you know, one of the complicating features of your work is that you have to examine an abolition movement, not just in Spain, but on the island of Cuba itself. Uh, mm -hmm. And there's a fascinating interplay that we uh, that I, I don't know that we have time to get into all of the features of it. But you mentioned uh, this topic in your introduction, and it's one that I thought was was really interesting. And that is this rise of a of a racist abolition movement in Cuba. Can you just say a little more about that? Yes. So. One of the things that uh, is quite central to the book is that the abolitionist movement, or I, I, I don't like to refer to it as a movement for reasons that I explained in the introduction, because I feel that there is no sense of coordination between the different elements of it. So I prefer to talk about anti-slavery or anti-slave trade voices or narratives or discourses. So. Um, some of the people who are going to advocate for the need to stop the slave trade or a slavery or both are not going to always do so uh, from egalitarian, anti-racist, progressive or liberal uh, points of view. They are going to do it very often from very materialistic, uh, looking at very short term results. Uh, and in some cases, uh, as you mentioned, Randy, from, from racist ideas. And the, the most obvious example of this is Jose Antonio Sacco that I mentioned at the beginning. This guy who is, is, is trained as a lawyer, he goes into uh, 
it's difficult to characterize if he if he's in a voluntary exile in Cuba or the conditions were not the right ones for him in Cuba and he decides to go on to to live in Paris but the the, the fact is that he's he never comes back to Cuba but when uh, there is a possibility for Cuban uh people to join the, the Spanish parliament in, in, in 1834, uh, he's going to campaign and he's going to be elected as Cuban representative in, in that parliament. So he is going to represent Cuban people in the reestablished uh, liberal parliament of, of 1834 in Spain. And he's going to be denied entry and that is going to spark a great controversy because basically the Spanish parliament decides that uh, the colonies or the colonial territories are not going to have representatives as it was originally planned and thought. Um, but one of the things that he's going to be and an, an, uh, he's going to advocate passionately uh, during the 30s and 40s is about the need to stop the Africanization of Cuba, the need to whiten in the island of Cuba. He's going to um, um, argue that everything bad that has ever happened in Cuba has to do with the fact that at that point, more than half of the population is non-white. And that therefore, every initiative to try to modernize its industry, to create a more competitive economy, to look more like, um, uh, you know, the, the industrialized powers uh, in Europe will always fail because of the... Uh, incapacity, the, uh, the, 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 the lack of the skills of the black population. And he argues that, you know, everything will be so much better if we can only have, if we can only count with the superior race, which for him, of course, is the, is the white population. So that profoundly and very clearly artic articulated, like there is no doubt of, of, of his racist ideology that is going to be the most um, significant anti-slave trade message during that period to the point that the British are going to collaborate with him because they are going to say, well, nobody else is saying anything about the end of the slave trade in Spain. So at least if, if he succeeds in his goal, we will stop the slave trade, which of course for the British is the first stage in the later abolition of slavery as a whole. So they are going to collaborate with him, but it's important to stress that the ideological distance between Sacco and Wilberforce or the African society at the time, it's huge, is 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 enormous, but they are going to see him as an ally. Yeah, it you know, it resonates in some ways with the free soil movement, I think, in the United States that's going on at about the same time. Eduardo tells me that we, we need to begin to wind down, um, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I've only gotten through, you know, a, maybe a third of my questions, which is a testament <laughs> to how rich this work is. So I guess I will I will end uh, then with uh, with a with a with a final uh, question to ask you to to talk about what forces converged in the 1860s that finally made abolition possible. So um, it's a combination of factors. On the one hand. Uh, the the end of, of the American Civil War, so the victory of the North and the decision of, of Lincoln to, to abolish slavery. Um, linked to that, the negotiation between the British and the Americans to um, create a more coordinated response in the Atlantic against the slave trade, the decision of, of the British, of the Americans to start enforcing death penalty against uh, slave traders as well. Uh, but also the, the general perception for Spain that there is no way they were going to be able to keep protecting the slave trade, that if they want to be in any level a relevant international actor, they will have to stop the slave trade because otherwise they are going to be completely isolated from uh, what, you know, what, they, what they identify and rightly so as the important powers of the Atlantic world, which are, of course, the British, but very much the, the Americans at, at that point. So um, very little is left for the Spanish to, to do. But that is kind of like what other historians have 
explain and i and i agree fundamentally with the, with the overall theory about that but i added something else in the book and is the emergence of an organized anti-slave trade and anti-slavery movement in spain in in the 60s in 1865 julio vizcarrondo a, a puerto rican activist and journalist together with concepcion arenal uh, uh, a journalist poet uh, an activist create in madrid the Sociedad Abolicionista Española, the Spanish society, uh, the Spanish anti-slavery society. And we cannot underestimate their, their, their role because at the same time that internationally, everything was making things a lot more complicated for the slave trade to continue. These people are gathering hundreds of people in Madrid, in public events, unprecedented for Spanish politics, who are saying, we need to stop the slave trade and we need to stop a slavery. So I think that that really shows to the Spanish government that there is no way back to the balancing out strategy, that they cannot keep rolling that anymore, and that they, they have to at least try to claim some agency in, in that process and be like, yeah, we're going to do this our way. Um, but the truth is that by the time that the legislation is finally passed and the, the final, the very final law for abolition of the slave trade in Spain goes through Spanish parliament, the slave trade had already collapsed in Cuba and there were no significant arrivals. It is possible that there were some uh, very late arrivals after that, probably not as part of the transatlantic slave trade, but as part of the intra-American slave trade, um, but it was not relevant in demographic or economic terms at that time. Thank you. Well, is that, that yeah, okay? Thank you very much, uh, Randy uh, and Jesus. It's a fascinating conversation uh, about uh, uh, Jesus' uh, new book. Um, we have plenty of.